think it's more a message to the church. Uh, second part, we're going to see uh, also the aspect of God's blessing through our obedience. And third part, we're going uh, to wrap all these things together and I hope uh, we will all be in this place of blessing. We were called to live under God's blessing. That's a fact. And in Psalm 133, we're going to read the whole psalm. It's just three Bible verses. It says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to, death, to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garments. As the dew of Hermon and as the dew that descend upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. Very short scripture, very short psalm. However, it contains a spiritual truth, and the spiritual truth of this psalm is that uh, when we have unity, unity with one another, and unity in Christ, God will ordain or God will command a blessing. So it says that God wants to command a blessing, even life, forevermore. Now, this psalm was sang as uh, pilgrims uh, walked to Jerusalem for the occasion of the Jewish feasts. It wasn't just a simple song. Now today we, we have beautiful songs that we have from all styles. We have uh, songs from the hymn book and we have modern songs and we, we praise the Lord with all kinds of songs. Uh, if we want to be biblical, we will praise the Lord just with the book of Psalms. But we don't do it anymore, however, uh, we, we keep this heritage of this book and we need to uh, understand it was a prophetic book also. And they will sing Psalm 133 uh, as they walk, uh, walk to Jerusalem. So uh, they didn't walk alone, so they were not singing solo. But very often they were singing with one another. So people from all walks of life, all paths of life, they, they had to go to, the, to celebrate different feasts in Jerusalem. And as they, they celebrated the feasts, they, they would meet people that they've never met before, and they had something in common, their faith. They were Jewish. And they were not all from the same race, because Jewish faith had, had also uh, different kinds of people. Uh, you had an uh, uh, Arab background, African uh, background, more Caucasian background. You had all sorts of, of races and colors and Jewish, Jewish people coming from all over uh, the place to gather in Jerusalem. And, and as they walked in Jerusalem, they were singing songs. And this is one of the songs they would sing uh, in, in their pilgrimage. Now, let me refer also... Uh, the, the, the verse that we studied this year, or the book we studied this year, 1 Corinthians 12, 12, and you have it written uh, at the wall at the back, it says, For as the body is one, and have many members, and all the members of that one body, being many are one body, so also is Christ, we're one body. So this is the illustration of who we are as Christians, of who we are as God's family. We are like one body. We are alive. And, and the, the body of Christ here on earth is called the church. As we celebrate communion, we uh, broke bread, which represents the body of Christ also. Represents the brokenness that we need to have when we approach God. And as a promise of God in Scripture, we, we've read that, uh, and we uh, need truly to understand this, that as Christians, we ought to be, we need to be in a place of blessing. If your life as a Christian is a life that is more, uh, resembles more a curse than a blessing, something is wrong. Something is wrong. So as Christians, we should be glad, we should be joyful, because we have God's blessing. And we have God's blessing in everything we do. Everything we, we put our hands to do should be blessed. If our life is not revealing or showing the blessing of God, we need to consider our ways, our life, and just align with God's Word. Now, in this promise of a place of blessing, there are also conditions. And blessings are also commanded. Because God says in Psalm 133, when you're in this place, I command blessing. 
So there's a condition, you, you, we need to do our part, and then God says, I will command blessing. And in the book of Psalms, also in Psalm 91, 1, uh, God commands his angels to protect us. And it says, for he will command his angels concern, concerning you to guard you in all of your ways. What is our way? Our way is our choices. We make choices in life. And as we make those choices, God promised, I will command my angels to keep you, to guard you. So He will command a blessing. Blessings and God's commands come from above. And in order for, to move God, to move the hand of God, we need truly to be in unity with Him. That's the first thing we need to understand. Also in Psalm 34, 7 says, The angel of the Lord and camp around, round about them that fear Him and deliver them. So we have another promise of protection. The angel of God is like uh, doing circles around us. And when he talks about the angel of God, talks about heavenly beings that are commanded from above to keep us, that are commanded from above to instruct us sometimes, that are commanded from above to bring us God's blessing. Jacob once had a dream, and in his dream he was seeing angels going up and down the ladder, bringing God's commands and God's blessings on earth. And we need to uh, uh, strive as Christians to live under God's blessing. There's a place of blessing. There's a place of blessing that God prepared for us. And if we're outside that place of blessing, then there is all sorts of issues and problems that we'll, we will experiment in life. And we will pray, we will not see answers. But we're in the place of blessing. God commands the blessing. Psalm 133, He says that He will send the commanded blessing if we dwell in unity with others, brothers and sisters. When uh, it was talking about the Jewish people, it was all that body of people that were gathering in Israel. And they were coming together. They were walking together to Jerusalem. They were walking together to worship God. Now, in, in that same sense as Christians, not only us here in our church in Greenfield Park, but Christians from around the world, we gather together to worship the Lord. We come from different paths of life. We come from different cultures, backgrounds, and education. But as we come together, as we're able to be one in Christ, then we're in a position and in a place where God can command the blessing. Amen? Are you following me? Alright, so let's move a little bit further. Now, Jesus uh, uh, taught in Luke 11, 17, that every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and the house divided against a house fall. So we, we, we need to see that the opposite of unity is division. Division means simple, simply two visions. Deep or do, dual, deep vision. Two visions. Whenever we have division, we have, whenever we have people that think differently about something, that there are uh, going in different paths, we have division. And when we have a divided house, Jesus Christ said a divided house will fall. But a house that is united will not only stand, but God commands blessing over unity. The Bible said also that God is not author of confusion. So if you feel confused, most likely you're not listening to the Holy Spirit. Most likely you're listening to other voices. If you feel confused, we need to be listening to the Holy Spirit. And we get in one mind and in one accord, and I'm telling you, we're going to see some, not only some souls saved, but God's commanded blessing upon us. Amen. And we need to see this as a church. And I know that sometimes we may have differences of opinion in certain matters. But do we need to be divided? I don't think so. And I don't think that's the will of God. So we have a choice in life. And the choice is to dwell in unity. I could choose not to go to church. And for certain seasons in my life, that was my choice. I chose, I said, no, I had enough of church. Now I need a season in which I'll, I'll pray, I'll read books, I'll read the Bible, but I don't want to go to church. But I found that in those seasons of life, even though I, will, I remain saved, in, even though God's, God was speaking to me, He was not commanding the blessing as He commands 
when I'm in that place, which is the place where He wants me to be. When you're in the place where God sent you, where you should be, you need to learn how to live along with others and to celebrate unity. Celebrate. Celebration is an important part of our worship. In 1 Corinthians 1.13, Paul was asking, Is Christ divided? I have news for you. He's not. Because a divided house will fall. So, is Christ divided? Is His body divided? Not at all. Not at all. But Jesus had to pray for His body, the church. And His prayer in John 17 was like this. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, which is us, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. So if we're in unity, if we run, if we learn how to be one body, then the world will see the glory of God. Why? Because when we're in unity as one body, God commands the blessing. God commands life. It's when we're in unity that we'll see souls getting saved. If we're divided, we will not see souls getting saved. We will not see the blessing of God. In fact, we'll open the door for failure. Do we want to fail or do we want to succeed? Jesus continued His prayer. Verse 22. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. Why do we need the glory of God? Simple answer. So that we'll be one. Now how can I be one with people that I, I don't have a lot in common? I can be one when I desi decide to crucify my desires and my flesh and to tell the Lord, Lord, I want to be one with the body of Christ where you brought me to. I want to be one. Al allow me, Lord, to do your will. And I want to be one. And then finally, let me read verse 23. And Jesus prayed, In them and you in me, may they be brought to complete unity. This is the prayer of Christ. May they be brought to complete unity. Now, we are responsible before Christ to make this a reality. And then He said, To let the world know that you sent me and have loved me, then even as you have loved me. Unity is so important. It's so important. We, we can be divided in many things, but in what regards to the things of God, we cannot be divided. We have to be united. And that's our choice. It's my choice. It's your choice. Some people choose to be always uh, in at war with someone or with something. Some people choose to oppose the government. Some people choose to oppose their boss. Some people choose to oppose their parents. Some people choose to oppose anything. Because there's something in our being, something in us, which is a root of evilness. Something that strives to aff for affirmation and for division. But when the Spirit of God comes, when God comes, when God is in our life, then we put aside our selfish desires and we say, I'm going to live in unity with you. I'm going to make sure that the prayer that Jesus Christ did for me in John 17 is true, is true, truthful, and it, it applies to my life. Amen. Can we do this? I know this is a message more for Christians, but we need to think about this thing. Because I'm telling you, the church that God planted here in Greenfield Park is a place of blessing. And God is commanding blessing. But blessing is conditional to us, Christians. Because we need to be in that place where we allow God to work in our lives. And we need to have unity. Now, how can we have unity if we're so different? Psalm 133 tells us that this kind of unity, this kind of blessing comes from above. And then it, it first says, it's like overflowing oil running down from the head to the beard to the collar of the priestly robes. So on verse 2, Psalm 123, it says, it's like an anointing that comes upon the head of the priest and it names Aaron. And Aaron is named because he was the symbol of priesthood. The symbol 
have worked in modern days we call the pastors, the priests, or the people that are, that are ahead or in front of a church, like myself. So the Bible clearly states that this unity comes as anointing flows from leadership, flows from the head to the robes. In those days when they anointed the priest, they would bring a shofar, which, which is a, 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 a kind of a horn, uh, and, and they will fill it with oil and pour that oil over the head of the priest as a symbol of God's anointing of the presence of the Holy Spirit. So in order to have unity, we need to see that unity first in terms of the leadership. Let's apply it to our church. Our leadership, our pastors, our deacons, you know, uh, our leaders, present worship leaders, our leadership has to be united first and receive that anointing. Otherwise, we will not be in the place of blessing. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, I'm not inventing these things. I'm just reading the Bible. And second, it talks about do. And do is a symbol of blessing. When Isaac blessed his son Jacob, he said, May God give you heaven's do. Meaning, the resource to prosperity. And we have many other examples that we will see next week about God's a blessing and prosperity that is promised in Psalm 133. Now, uh, both dew and uh, this overflowing oil have something in common. And it's that they come from above. A very interesting aspect when we read this verse is that it talks about the dew from Mount Hermon just touching Jerusalem. And those are two different places. This, this is a picture, an actual picture of, of this mountain. And this is snow there, because there's snow there. There's snow in, in Israel. And, and uh, there was dew, uh, which is water that comes from above, just covering that mountain. And when it tells that the mountain, the Mount Hermon, will bring dew to Zion, which is Jerusalem, is giving us an image of unity among God's people. Because, you know, Jews, like, you know, Christians, like, doesn't matter who, they're not particularly very united. And in those days, they had even two kingdoms. They had uh, uh, certain uh, affairs and uh, politics, and they, they wouldn't agree with the many, many number uh, of things. But when the Bible says that the dew of Mount, Her Mount Hermon will come and uh, just flow to Jerusalem, he talks about unity among God's people. And they had to understand this. So they will sing it as they were going to Jerusalem. We need to have this same kind of unity. But we can choose not to have it. That's your choice. Both of these things flow from the head of Aaron to, to, the, to his robes or from the top of the mountain to the bottom of the mountain. So we, we, if we want to be in, in a place of God's blessing, we need to bless those that are in leadership above us. And this is a principle that as a pastor, I, I don't feel very comfortable sometimes to teach. Because people can misinterpret these things. But let me tell you this. In a place or in a church where there is no honor regarding leadership, there is no miracles. And this is very silent now. Probably you're thinking, where are you going, where are you going with this message? <laughs> I'm going to a place where I want to encourage you as a church to pray for your leaders. Pray for your leaders. Pray for your deacons. Pray for your pastors. Encourage them. People that are doing something positive in the church, encourage them. Either they're leading worship, either they're downstairs taking care of kids, encourage them. Instead of criticizing, place your word of blessing upon them. It's your choice. It's your choice. So in the church, unity starts from above. So when leadership is opposed or not recognized, you know what happens? The anointing stops. And there's no worse thing than being in the church without God's anointing. It's horrible. Even Jesus couldn't do many miracles, and we see in Mark 6, 45, he affirmed that a prophet is without honor in his hometown. And he tried to pray for people, 
And the Bible strictly says that he was not able to do miracles in his hometown. Just a few. And he had to come to the outside and pray for people. It's not that his power was limited. He could do all the miracles he wanted. The power of God was upon him. But when the, the Bible mentions this, it wants to teach a very important principle for you and me today. Without honor, without honor, if you don't honor God, don't expect miracles. If you don't honor leadership in a church, don't expect the church to go much further. We need to have unity. And this is not just a, a matter of choice. This is a matter of, of good sense, of common sense. That is, this is why in Hebrews 13 and 7, talking about church leaders, it says, Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch over your souls, as they that must be become, that they may do it with joy, and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. What is an unprofitable thing? Okay, let me give you an example. You bought a house for $200,000, and now you put it on the market for $150,000. Is that a good deal? Come on, that's a good deal. <laughs> it's unprofitable. You invest it, but your investment has no return, or has a negative return. It's unprofitable. Now, if I'm going to buy a house, and I want to have a profit, I want to buy a house in a place that I know that in a few years, instead of having uh, gangs or drug dealers in my neighborhood, I have a good middle class kind of people. And if I buy a house, let's say for $300,000, and in two years I sell the house for $400,000, is that good or bad? That's profitable. So how do I do that kind of investment? I need to be smart and I need to understand the rules of the market of real estate. Now this is just an example. Let me talk about God's blessing. Do you want to receive God's blessing? Yes. It's not profitable for a church to cause problems to their leaders because God cannot, will not command His blessing in a dividing house. Does that make sense? Okay, now I have some people looking at me with big eyes, asking, asking themselves, why is he preaching this? Because I'm here to bring you profit. Spiritual profit. My desire is to see miracles in this house. People getting saved. This is why the leadership of this church is here, praying in the morning, Coming, you know, at time, out of time, during the day, during the night, you know, praying uh, uh, overnight, you know, do all sorts of things because we want to see the common good of the church. Now, if you're not able to be united with leadership, there's something very simple you need to do. You need to move to another church where you'll be able to be united with leadership. That's very simple. That's very simple. Otherwise, let me tell you what can happen. I didn't read the scripture, but when it talks about communion, it says that we need to examine ourselves. And as we examine ourselves, and if we're not contributing for the unity of the body, if we're contributing to the vision, God will not command blessing, but it gets to a point in which God can even say, okay, you want to play things with, with the devil and with the enemy? We, you want to bring the vision? And God takes his hands off. And then we see a lot of bad things happen. I don't want to see that happen here. It will not happen in my watch. This is why I pray and keep praying and keep praying and keep praying. But certain times when there's tremendous opposition to leadership, you will not only not see miracles, but it gets to a point in which churches are trapped in a situation in which every two years they need to send another pastor. Or every three years they need to send another pastor. Or every four years they need to send another Because pastors can lead the flock up to the point in which the flock wants to be led. 
Because if the flock doesn't want to be led, it's like the people of Israel in the desert. They will have to wait 40 years for a generation to die and expect that something will happen. As a church, we have a responsibility to seek the Lord and to understand that it's not profitable for us as people to resist authority. I'm under authority. I have pastors that are my counselors. I'm in a denomination. I submit to them. I seek counsel. And if they tell me, don't do this, I don't do it. I don't do it. Why? Because in, in our days, people see the, the pastor as the preacher. But we're not here to preach. We're here to lead. Preaching is a part of the ministry. But if we just come to church on Sunday and we don't get involved in ministry, then we're not part of a body. We are disassembled. We are everywhere. Let, let me just finish and, and give you this example. How many of you have seen a laser light? Not the laser light we use, you know, to point things you know, on the PowerPoint or that sell at the, at the dollar store, but the real laser, the one that cuts. Have you ever seen one of those lasers? They do surgical operations now, they use a laser. Now, let me give you this analogy. We have spotlights here. This is not a laser light. It's really strong. I'm telling you, I, I feel the heat of these spotlights. I don't like them. I need to use them so you can see me better and uh, people can see us better over the recording, the video recording. I'm not going to put a laser light here. What is the difference? A laser light works approximately like this. There's a source of energy and there's small particles of light. They're called photons. And, and in a laser, the photon just connects to another photon and connects to another one. And they do a chain, they're in unity, and one connects to two and to other two and to other two. And, and this chain focused in one point. So all the power, all the light, all that energy is focused in one tiny spot. And it can cut iron. It can cut steel. It can burn all sorts of things. It can kill. Because of that concentration of energy. <coughs> Excuse me. And this talks about unity. Those pho photons, they just do that chain, they unite it, and they focus all the energy in one single point. Now with these spotlights, we also have photons, but they're not united. They're dispersed. That's why the only thing I can feel is heat. It will not cut through me. It has no great power than giving light and a little bit of heat. But the laser, the laser beam, it can cut through steel because it's focused in unity in one single spot. And all of those particles are working together in order to cut through that point. Let me talk about the power of God in a church. We can be a spotlight church. And what I mean by this, we have the light, we have some warmth, and we have the gospel, we have all these things, we're doing good things, but we're not achieving much. But we can be the laser beam church that cuts through sin, that surgical pinpoints and, and manifests the power of that light Amen. in a way that the spotlight can. What kind of church do we want to be? The comfortable church in a comfortable building, with a comfortable temperature, with a comfortable environment, or do we want to be in the place of blessing, where God moves things around, turns things sometimes upside down, heals, believers, transforms, baptizes in the Holy Spirit, manifests the power of God in a visible way to the people around us. What kind of church do we want to be? This is the question. This is the question. What kind of light are we going to manifest? Now this scripture says, Blessed are the troublemakers, for they will be called sons of God. How many of you know this scripture? Huh? Oh, okay. So 
some of you know the scripture. <laughs> Blessed are the peacemakers. What's the difference between a peacemaker and a troublemaker? <laughs> See, the troublemaker will not be called Son of God. In fact, people sometimes come to church and their test the testimony of their lives is so horrible that instead of bringing people to church, people stay away from them. They say, I don't want anything to do with church because I've met my cousin and he's a religious person. He talks about scripture, this and that, but his life is a misery. His kids are uh, just rebellious. There's all sorts of bad things and he's always quoting the Bible. Troublemakers. The peacemakers, they'll be called sons of God. Now, if we had God's blessing, we work towards peace. And let me explain to you the meaning of peace. And to do so, the New Testament uh, uses the word peace. The word is Irene. Any Irene here? Any, any, any lady named Irene? You have an Irene there. Now I'm talking about Irene. <laughs> because the, this is the Greek word for peace. It's a beautiful word. It's full of meaning and describes tranquility, serendipity, uh, describes like a boat sailing on a calm sea, harmony. It's like a song where the notes and the chords are in perfect harmony. And uh, it conveys the idea of an absence of strife or an absence of war. And we can understand this. When we talk about world peace, we talk about absence of war. When I talk about world peace, I don't talk about absence of war, I'm talking about Jesus, the Prince of Peace, which is a lot different. And the Jewish word for peace is the word Shalom. And, uh, and, and the word Shalom has a, a, the same meaning, but it's a little bit more. Shalom was used by Jewish people to bless others with God's peace. And it's not just, that it doesn't convey just the absence of peace, but it conveys the, the idea of blessing being imparted to you. When I was uh, raised uh, uh, in my first church, everybody will greet with the word Shalom. Everybody will greet with the word Shalom. And many Christians today, they use this Hebrew word Shalom. And the idea of Shalom it's, it's, I wish you not only the absence of all that made harm, but the presence of everything that makes a person good. So the peacemakers are not the people that escape conflict, but the peacemaker is the person that produces blessing, whatever he is, and his presence will bring order and God's blessing. A peacemaker in that sense, it's not the person that tries to reconcile others, but it's the person that carries that blessing that allows God peace to be manifested in the place. And this is very important. You see, in order to bring shalom to the churches, even Paul and Peter the apostles were saying, okay, if you have troublemakers in your church, you do like this, you meet with them. Try to call them to reason, once, twice, third time, put him out of the church and don't even talk to them. If they cross the, the street, don't even greet them in the square, because you don't want to have any relationship with these kind of people. And you might say, that's really harsh. It is. You know why? Because the concern of the apostles was to have an atmosphere in church in which the Holy Spirit, the Shekinah glory of God, will come and dwell. Grace is something that we all need. God's grace is tremendous and is sufficient to break all the powers of hell. But if you want to see God's grace, you need to comply to God's rule. It's not enough to know about God. We need to know God. And if we know God and His peace, we want to dwell in His peace. And as Christians, we are called to work together as a team. Team, together, as a unified group of believers. E, each one of us. A, this will achieve miraculous results. M, more than we could ever do on our own. W, wow, 
what God can do through our teamwork. O, oh, overcomers on the melon. R, revelations are unleashed to the team. And K, kingdom growth occurs when people are led from here to eternity. Behold how good and pleasant it is. When brethren dwell together in unity, it's like the precious ointment upon the head that run down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garments as the dew of Hermon, and as the dew that descend upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. Today, we need to go back to the Bible and know the Bible. Not just the book, not just have a mental knowledge of the book, but apply it into our lives. Do we bring shalom wherever we go? If the Prince of Peace is in us, we should manifest His peace. You see, Jesus didn't agree with, uh, necessarily with everybody. With hypocrites, He will tell them exactly what they were. The Pharisees, I've never seen Him, you know, acting in a peaceful manner with the Pharisees. When He entered the temple and He saw that they were trading and doing all sorts of business, He turned all the, the tables upside down. This is the Prince of Peace. Do we really understand God's peace? God's peace is not about the absence of war. God's peace is about God's presence and shalom, that blessing being conveyed to us. If I see my kids doing, doing something that I know it will lead them to, to, to serious problems or destruction, I warn them. I warn them. As a pastor of this church, I need to warn this church. Because I am accountable for your souls before the Lord. And I want to tell you, it's not profitable for a church to have, to antagonize people or to create division. And God will not allow His blessing to be poured wherever we don't have unity. So unity is key. That's why Jesus, just before going to the cross, He said, I pray that they will find this unity. And it's so hard to find. I'm so different from many of you. You're so different from people around you. We're all so different. But there's one book that will help us to bring us into unity. Now today we talked about how Christians should live in a place of blessing. We also mentioned how we can, how can we have unity. And we uh, saw this aspect in church unity starts from above. Now next week, we're going to see, we're going to start seeing the commanding blessing of God in a more practical way. I told you today, it's a message more for the church. Next week, we're going to talk about a, mess, a message more individually. And what God wants to do in our personal lives. Not only He wants to save us, but He wants to heal us. He wants to prosper us. He wants to bless us more than we, we even ask or think. And there's two kinds of blessing. There's the corporate blessing. It's when God comes to a church and, wow, man, everybody's blessed. It's a place of revival. I've traveled through revivals around the world. I've seen revivals in Brazil. I've seen revivals in Colombia. I've seen revivals in Africa. I've seen revivals all over the world. I want to see revival here. I want to see revival here. I've seen revival, a small revival in Ontario as we were you know, opening churches all over the place and God was just blessing that region in the night. It was amazing. I want to see that, that corporate blessing here, but I have news for you. Even if the corporate blessing is not coming, we can learn how to place ourselves and our family in a place of blessing. Even if everyone around us is in a place of curse, we can be in that place of blessing. The secret was given by Joshua, and we're going to learn that secret next week. He said, it doesn't matter to me what you're doing. Me and my house, we will submit. We will serve the Lord. It doesn't matter if the whole nation turns their back on God. Me and my house, we will serve the Lord. This is the blessing.